Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me. It's a fabulous time to be visiting this amazing city. But I wanted to um, tell you about another city right now that has a layer of snow and a lot of ice and cold uh, playing out uh, in Toronto, north of the border, where I'm from. The ideas I want to talk about are in relationship to the landscape of the city of Toronto, but also the work that Evergreen's been doing, an organization I founded 25 years ago focused on urban ecology an organization that had its early roots in, so to speak, in, in engaging citizens in the processes of restoring cities, restoring green spaces in cities. But as my career within the organization has evolved, uh, I began the organization when I was 25, pretty much fresh out of university with a bit of background and, and work in, in, in areas of real estate development. Uh, so I'm, I'm coming up in my 50th, wondering how I've stayed on one career of that entire duration. Uh, but it's been an incredibly exciting space. It's been a wildly diverse uh, collection of themes that are intersecting on, on cities and what's happening in cities. And it's, been a, it's fed my, my true entrepreneurial energy. So I want to walk you through a few things that I'm seeing in some of the experiences that I'm, I'm participating in globally. I'm just, just in from Davos, from the World Economic Forum, which is continuing to go on today and tomorrow. But I was there for the first four days. And, and the conversations that are playing out there around cities and the future of cities are, are particularly interesting uh, given the scale of the challenge globally. So the first idea, which many of you are, are loosely aware of, if not through your own experience, you might be aware of this language, the urban century, this moment in time when people are now living in cities more than they are in rural landscapes. So over 50% of the world's population is living in cities. That population issue is particularly interesting when we, when we look uh, out into the future and we think that um, over the course of the next 50 years that urbanization pattern is going to accelerate and not decelerate. But looking backwards, the environmental movement has been largely driven by uh, these wilderness landscapes, these, these rainforests. This was what nature, this was what environmentalists talked about and did. So when I started Evergreen 25 years ago, focused on cities, quite frankly, I, we were not considered an environmental organization, period. And we're weirdly still shunned a little bit by the environmental community uh, in Canada and in Toronto, because this is what environment's all about. This is what Canadian uh, winters and, and environment is all about, the polar bears, uh, of course the tigers in other parts of the world, etc. And Canada, again, as a country, has its symbol as a natural uh, idea, the, the maple leaf. So Canadians think of themselves as deeply connected to nature, deeply uh, related to wilderness and whatnot, and yet 85% of Canadians live in cities, more than the United States and well more than the uh, global average. Uh, Toronto, this is a kind of funny the aerial shot of Toronto is the fourth largest city in North America. So it's a deeply urbanized country and our challenges around urbanization are tremendous. But it begins and it extends into these global issues which is really about population explosion. Yeah, the dotted line across the kind of 40-60% line there is really where we're at in history right now but the population expansion globally right now is largely what's in play and causing this, this migration to where jobs are, where there is energy, where there is a sense of opportunity and cities are attracting this bubble of population growth. But a second phenomenon is playing out at the same time as this population expansion is unfolding globally and concentrating in cities. Uh, the other phenomena that th this particular chart represents is urban sprawl, as you can see from the title. But the little kind of purple chart on the left side is population increase. So St. Louis, 35% increase in its population. And the time frame is irrelevant, but this is about a 15-year time frame from mid-90s through till 2010. Whereas it had a 355% increase in its its footprint. So sprawl massively dominating the storyline of cities, despite the fact that population chart you saw one prior to this is also ballooning at the same time. So the cross-section of these two phenomena is that urban issues are unbelievably um, complex right now and challenged by population and the design of cities. And so this is really where my career inside Evergreen focused initially on urbanization in relationship to ecology is now intersecting with some of these bigger issues, these larger kind of uh, patterns of urbanization. Now, this is a historical chart. So where is this going to go in the next 50 years? So what is the pattern going to be for the next 50 years? And that's where some of my most uh, interesting work is right now, is foresight work on the future of cities. Over the next 50 years, there are suggestions that the population of cities will go from 
3.5 billion currently, half the world's population, to roughly 7 billion. So essentially doubling. The population of cities will effectively double. That's what most people's predictions are of urbanization. So you take a doubling of the population and you mix in urban sprawl and you have a complete disaster. And so how do we insert ourselves with some solutions in here? This is, I'm not trying to create the doomsday storyline here for all of us, but, but I do want to set up the, 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 the global issue. Obviously, intensification of den and density is one of the storylines. This is in Hong Kong. And how do you uh, manage all those people? You put them in high rises, and this becomes their urban experience. This becomes the way we live in cities. La Paz, another opportunity. You stay low, but you spread out like this. Not all that appealing either. This is the big idea that we've all had in North America, you know, the picket fence and the lovely 50-foot lot among all your friends who have a similar sort of format and you're good to go. But that hasn't really happened. I mean, we've ended up more with this uh, and the, the, the kind of harsh experience that this represents. I, I'm sure there's a tree in there somewhere, but that is not exactly one that connects people to the land. So as an organization, uh, we focus on a few key ideas. One of the most prominent themes that we've advanced uh, assertively is this issue of school properties. How do, you, how do you invest in and transform children's learning environments from this sort of prison-like environment, asphalt, chain link fence, devoid of a, of, of a lot of sensory experiences, certainly devoid of nature, and transform them into something that's a little bit more inspiring, a little bit more playful, a little bit more engaging of diverse learning styles, and, and, and fundamentally Fundamentally, how do you begin to recreate a connection to nature? How do you begin to inspire and evoke and, and, and provoke curiosity, as Charles was indicating earlier? Curiosity in my world is a really important ingredient in all of this stuff. One of our biggest funders back in 1994 or 5 uh, stepped in and funded us with a very generous grant with almost zero interest in the environmental or ecological work that we were doing, as much as we thought that was the big idea. Their investment was, was in the notion of democracy. They felt they were funding us to, uh, because we were expressing democracy, where giving people a chance to participate in shaping their landscapes, giving people the courage uh, and provoking people to share in the, in the transformation of the landscape around their values. And so uh, in this particular image, obviously woven willows and a small food garden and a school property. The transformation of these landscapes can be small or grand. They all have an impact. We've now worked with a little over five, well, it's about 5,500 schools across Canada. Uh, Evergreen, for those who don't know us, uh, we're about 150 staff and about a $20 million budget annually, and we have an array of relationships across the country moving these big ideas in Canada. And, uh, but sometimes they're small ideas, and uh, some of these projects are tiny and incredibly powerful in their scale as small interventions. Some of them are much bigger. This is actually at our Brickworks facility, the site we've transformed in the middle of Toronto, and we've created this kind of showcase for how children's learning environments should be designed. It doesn't necessarily express all dimensions of ecology and nature, but it is an incredibly rich space for learning about and participating in placemaking, in, in meaning making among ch school children and the way they think about their landscapes. But ecology and ecological principles are at the base of all of the activities that are developed here. You know, this is a butterfly garden created. This was a sort of map led by one of the teachers with the student participation. All of a sudden, they start knowing the names of plant species. All of a sudden, they start understanding what grows where and what doesn't grow where. And the learning, the curiosity that's fed in the process is profoundly transformational in their sense of respect uh, and, their sense of under and their understanding of the landscapes. Something a little closer to home for you here, Alice Waters Project. Certainly a fabulous, the edible landscape, certainly a fabulous expression of the same idea. This is the sort of stuff we're pushing very, very assertively in Canada. And I, I, from what I understand, we have the largest network of schools doing this sort of stuff in the world in Canada. And a lot of that comes from great support we've received at a number of municipal level school boards and also at the federal level in Canada. This, this idea of investing in early childhood development is a very big theme in Canada begins with mothers being given 12 months maternity leave and extends into, which I know in the United States is a tiny bit of a soft point, or difficult point, uh, but this early childhood development agenda is big in Canada and, and this is why parts of our programs have advanced so, so quickly. So engaging people has really the primary theme for us. How do you engage people in the process? 
As much as I love great design and I'm a huge proponent of landscape architecture, especially when it's done beautifully, uh, I also think there's something very, very powerful in participatory design processes, or a lot of P's in there, um, engaging people in the process of creating spaces to create meaning, to create uh, respect relationships that otherwise aren't possible when they're just handed a finished product. And so engaging people in planting trees, as simple as it is, has a very, very uh, powerful impact. So I'm going to bounce from this, this work we've been doing at the, at the community level in schools across Canada to a site that we took over about 10 years ago, an old industrial site, a 42-acre site, seven-minute bike ride from the most expensive commercial real estate in Canada, Young and Bloor. Uh, that intersection is really the hub of, it's our, it's our the nexus of commercial uh, exchange, retail exchange. Seven minute bike ride because I bike it every day is to what this has become an old industrial site, an old brick factory, 42 acres called the Brickworks. That gives you a better idea of what it is. The Brickworks is that collection of buildings. This was actually pre-construction on our behalf, but we'd done all the renovation and restoration work in the valley or portions of the valley. That quarry that's no longer a quarry is the collection of ponds. It's a 42 acre site in the middle of the city sitting in the bottom of a ravine system that I'll talk about in a minute or two. But this particular complex of buildings was uh, under a 50-year flood moratorium. No building in the valley. Uh, we broke the, the development moratorium and began construction on creating a site that would be uh, wet flood-proofed, be able to manage and deal with flooding. This past 12 months, we've had three floods. Each time it flooded, we'd have anywhere from three to five feet of water across the entire site, uh, submersing everything. Uh, and we would be up and running within 36 hours because we designed it to deal with floods, deal with, deal with managing that type of water in and then out. But the creation of this site was really about creating, after creating a network of activity across the country, all these small projects, we thought it might be really powerful and important to create a, a, um, a, a hub for this idea. A little bit the opposite, actually, of what a lot of big institutions do, the art galleries and the science centers and the, and the museums, where they create the, the iconic facility and then think, oh my God, how do, we, how, do we how do we get people beyond the walls of this project involved? We actually had a network of activity across the country and we thought, okay, time to build something that's centralized that, to come together and show this idea at a grander scale. And so $55 million worth, well, it's actually $95 million worth of investments in the buildings have created this, this center for urban ecology, a center for the future of cities, 16 buildings, classrooms, conference facilities, exhibition galleries, kids camps, farmers markets, a whole array of activity across the site, all of them kind of happily um, commingling in a, in a random way. Some people still don't really understand what the site's all about because it's about so many different things. Um, we started off with food and food markets, farmers markets. The farmer's market, we opened it up, uh, and on our first year of opening the farmer's market, before we even began construction, the National Post, one of our national papers in, the, in, the, in Canada, uh, identified it as, they, they listed 80, 86 reasons to stay in Toronto this summer, and our farmer's market was number one. And uh, it doesn't say much for Toronto in the summertime, I suppose, but, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but we still got the number one marker. And that was only after all sorts of people told us that we couldn't possibly create a farmer's market at this location. But it is amazing what perseverance and how, uh, and I think some people have underestimated the hunger, so to speak, that people have for these more authentic, uh, grittier experiences. This is a sort of space we've created. This is where the kids' camp is run. The kids' camp is sold out for the summer already. We have a thousand kids for the kids' camp in the summertime. It's sold out. They bake food. They grow food. There's, you know, there's a pizza oven underneath that little pipe right there. They go into the valley system. They go into the ravine system. So the ravine system is what I'm actually going to move to next. This is the shot of it at night. So Toronto is not well known to people for a couple of big things, but one in particular is its ravine system. These webs of green weave throughout the entire city. 44,000 acres. 44,000 acres of ravine system in Toronto. It's the single largest ravine system in the world. It is massively unique. Again, who can even put their 44,000 acres in their head? It's a big, big, big chunk of linear green space that's seven river, way, river valleys, many of them actually connected at the top in the watershed up at the top. That collection of ravine systems 
uh, at the top end is connected into a 1.8 million acre green belt, the largest green belt of any city in the world. The second largest is 1.4 million acres in Germany. So Toronto has this incredibly uh, rich asset in its landscape. Now, you look out the window in Toronto, you don't feel it the same way you do here, or you do in Vancouver, or you do in Sydney, or whatever. Uh, but it's because it sinks down below the, the sight lines, it's, it's down into the valley. But they're secluded, peaceful, incredible spaces, this valley system. We are leading right now in collaboration with the City of Toronto and uh, the Toronto Conservation Authority, a strategy to actually create a master plan for this system. There is no master plan for this system. It was, it was a sort of protected back in 1953, I guess it was, when Hurricane Hazel blew through town, and the valley system all of a sudden became an incredible asset because it, it moved floodwaters away from sensitive landscapes where people lived and, and kind of moved it out of the system, out of the city, down into the valley system and out to the Lake Ontario. Um, so the valley system was an accidental success story. And the challenge we have now, or maybe the opportunity we have now as a city, is to name it and, 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 and design it and bring identity to, to ourselves as Torontonians and an identity to the city globally for what the, this sort of an asset represents. So there's a, a name emerging. We're going to lead a campaign, a probably notionally a $100 million campaign, it sounds crazy, but a $100 million campaign over a 20 year period to restore and celebrate with art and with connections and with gateways and ecological work to restore this valley system. And to do a master plan, my God, there's no master plan for this system, it's, it's, it's astounding. Anyway, the ribbon is the name of the campaign. Whether the ribbon becomes an identity, there's no name for this system. There's no, no identity, there's no there there. So we're trying to figure out whether we need to name it or whether we let that emerge. This sort of a city doesn't exist. It's funny, the future uh, that we all have, the Jetsons and these things, this is not what we want. As much as we play with these great images, we don't want this stuff. So our big piece of the puzzle here for future city building is to find ways to integrate nature in cities and to provoke a culture of nature in our own city, Toronto, but across Canada. And if we can work with you guys on some stuff, that'd be a, a real privilege. So thank you very much.